The Prime Minister highlights the progress of women globally while noting efforts to derail the advancements. Declining rates of immunization, especially among children, a major worry. A mysterious ailment leaves a woman struggling to earn a living. And in sports, the completed Ryan Brathwaite track has been handed over in time for BSAC. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. As the global economy prepares to mark the 30th anniversary of the Fourth World Conference on Women and adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, Barbados says there are movements globally seeking to reverse some of the progress. Prime Minister Mia Amar Motley says those talks achieved a lot for women globally. She made the comment while welcoming Communist Party of China member Madame Huang Zhuawe to the island, noting her visit provides an opportunity to discuss how Barbados yet again can have a strong presence at the 2025 talks. Ms. Motley said the partnership with the Barbados Labour Party and the Communist Party is critical because it is our policies as parties that will inform our policies as governments. And therefore this exchange is absolutely important to ensure that we do not along the way misstep in any way. In addition to that, we are very, very comfortable with the relationship that we've had to be able to build with successive Chinese ambassadors in Barbados. And we continue to ensure that our people and your people who the ambassadors have brought through the years have that opportunity for the people-to-people -people exchange. Speaking through an interpreter, Madame Huang Zhuawei, who is on her first visit to the island, says it is to deepen party-to-party -party exchanges and cooperation. Barbados is an important country in the Caribbean region and also a good friend and close partner for China in the region. Over the past half a century, since we established diplomatic relations, we've always respected each other and treated each other as equal, um, and our political mutual trust has been deepening. Our two countries also enjoy fruitful practical cooperation and sound co co coordination and communication on international affairs. And our relations is a model for South-South cooperation. The high-ranking member of the Communist Party of China also met this morning with executive members of the Barbados Labour Party, including Chairman, His Honor Senator, the Most Honorable Reginald Farley. He said the talks would focus on sustaining the fraternal relations the two countries have enjoyed for decades and would also cover issues such as women and development, social policy and youth. Well, what has been their experience in the enhancement of the, the, the role of women. They have a major international women's conference coming up um, later this year, early next year, for which they're obviously seeking to gather support. We will discuss um, youth development, what are some of the strategies and programs used um, by them as a political party to uh, get more youth engagement. And that's been a challenge around the world for, for everyone, how do you get more young people involved? And basically as one political party to another, just exchanging views on um, internal workings as well as uh, issues of the day. Madame Huang is the most senior member of the Chinese government to visit the island since State Councillor Wu Yi in 2003. She says while this is her first visit to Barbados, the island is close to her heart. It's a testimony of friendship between our two peoples. Uh, we both have traditional friendship as well as strong political relations between our two parties. In particular, we can never forget that 47 years ago, the Barbados and the Barbados Labour Party took the lead among Caribbean countries to establish diplomatic relations with the PRC. And you've always honored the One China principle. And we've supported each other on matters 
goods related to our core interests. News from the estimates debate now. Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. the Most Honorable Jerome Walcott, has sounded the alarm on the declining rates of immunization, especially among children. He says without breaks across the globe and the upcoming international events on island, this worrying trend is a top priority for the health ministry. The fall off in normal childhood immunizations is a major concern for us. It is a concern because, as I said then, that the numbers, especially for MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, have fallen off. And currently in the world, in Europe and North America, there is an outbreak, a resurgence of measles. So it is something we have to be concerned about, bearing in mind that Cricket World Cup is coming here in a couple of months. So this is something that we're concerned about. Meanwhile, Acting Chief Nursing Officer Anastasia Jordan says the ministry has started a public campaign to address the issue of vaccine hesitancy. We have put a program in place where polyclinics are now going to be open on the weekend so that we can encourage mothers with children who have been defaulters because we recognize that we've had a long list of defaulters over the last three years due to the COVID and the vaccine hesitancy. So we are targeting those defaulters so that we can address that matter, especially with the MMR. We are also, also doing public service announcements starting on Monday to drum up a awareness of the importance of vaccine use and trying to get the public to understand the importance of trusting that vaccines do save lives. The Ministry of Health and Wellness plans to fully update its records over a 30-month period. That submission came from Minister of State in that ministry, Davidson Ishmael. He says on completion of the project, it is expected that all patient records will be fully digitized and the hospital's information systems more secure. The ministry has a vision that through the procurement and the, the implementation and rollout of that health information system, that wherever a citizen of Barbados interacts with the polyclinics or which is primary care all the way through to the hospital from accident emergency all the way through to the wards that that electronic record of them would be able to follow them wherever they go so the health information system and the digitization and digitalization process that we're undertaking right now of the qh it project which, as I said before, is a 30-month project, is really designed to get us to the stage where the QAH and the rest of the health network is performing at a far more advanced, technologically uh, proficient level. We also heard from the lower house that cases of dengue fever have peaked on island with senior medical officer Dr. Leslie Rollock reporting that there were over 500 cases in January. While there were fewer deaths, there have been more hospitalizations for dengue. Dr. Rollock attributed this to people recognizing the warning signs and taking action. The update came as the estimates debate continued. The deaths have occurred in persons that have other comorbidities, other illnesses that make them more likely not to survive the severe stage of um, dengue infection. Since that peak in January, in February, we've gone down to just under 350 cases. I don't want to call the wrong numbers, about 342 in February. And we're hoping that that will continue in March. Dr. Rollock says dengue is an endemic illness with two types circulating, subtypes 2 and 3. She adds that to stop the outbreak, adult mosquitoes that contain the virus must be killed. And to do that, we need to fog. But to prevent new um, mosquitoes getting infected, we need householders, and we've asked them, as well as the Environmental Health Department, to look for the larvae in cases where they might be breeding and destroy them. So we've, since the, we've recognized that there's been an outbreak, we've been speaking to the public and encouraging the catchments with the staff that they have to actually go and do the inspections, look for the larvae, throw them away, scrub the containers, and for the fogging to occur um, in the areas where we will always have mosquitoes, but where there seems to be a press um, of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes when the rain falls and mosquitoes breed, we will have Coolets mosquitoes as well, but fortunately they do not carry um, dengue. 
Barbados assured the Ministry of Health and Wellness is addressing the vexing issue of overgrown lots across the island. Deputy Chief Environmental Officer Ronald Chapman revealed that to date, some 15 people were brought before the law courts and judgments received in five. One person was charged over $1,000 for their overgrown lot. Several other notices have already been served, including over 63 in the South. It was also revealed that the Ministry of Health has recommended an amendment to the legislation to make the process easier. We would appreciate that having to go to court and have adjournments and, and wait until... It, it's a, time, a, a, a very time-consuming um, process. And while that time is, is, is proceeding, the the violation is, is existing and persons are being inconvenienced and I dare say their health is being put at risk. So the new the, the recommendation makes it a lot easier to address these issues and it makes it a lot is, easier to bring resolution and um, allow Barbadians to enjoy their property um, even more. Mr. Chapman addressed concerns regarding the mosquito and rat nuisances. He says programs that commenced this year were in response to an increase in the number of complaints. Pace, um, we have started, let me just say, we, we have started in the city, and we, well, in the city, we started from the areas for the rodent, because they're separate programs, although they're being run um, jointly. We are dealing, we are working from the Oysters Bay Garden, right down the urban corridor, right down to the uh, Brighton's Beach. This is where the rodents are concerned and where mosquitoes are concerned. This is island wide. We also heard from Parliament that increasing the number of on-call staff with the Accident and Emergency Department will go a long way in reducing the wait times for patients. Making the point was head of the department at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Dr. Anne-Marie Cruikshank. She says requests have been made for additional manpower in a number of areas and suggested this would be a major step in the move towards a fully operational 24-hour hospital. So we've requested two additional consultants to be part of our team, also senior registrars, which will give us more coverage with respect to senior cover in the accident and emergency department. Also other categories of staff in terms of departmental aides, orderlies, more nurses, more nursing assistants, where we can get a greater coverage for the patients. Um, as you know, we are currently short staff and a lot of nurses and doctors, sessional doctors and flexi nurses have to come to assist. So I think staffing is something we're focusing on extremely important in the accident emergency to move towards this 24 hour hospital that we're hoping for. We'll take a break here, but coming up, we'll tell you about a woman's struggle with a mysterious illness. A woman suffering from a debilitating illness is holding out hope that she will eventually find out what has been making her sick. More than a year after the first symptoms appeared, she's coping as best she can while struggling to earn a living. Sharika Griffith has the story, and I must warn you, some of the images may be disturbing. The past 19 months have been nothing short of a nightmare for 33-year-old Tiffany Smith. She's been trying to cope with a medical condition that has totally changed her life. The doctor is not saying heal anymore. He's saying he wants to bring me to a bearable stage, that this may be lifelong. The mother of a three-year-old boy is facing mounting debt and expensive medication after noticing a rash and a burning sensation days after beginning a new job in August 2022. The symptoms got worse when Miss Smith, who had been hired as a sales associate, was reassigned to the company's paint room. There was no relief, so I decided to go to the general hospital. I was seen there, they said it was a hair follicle. It may be a hair follicle infection. I went back in three days and they were saying it was MRSA. I had went probably around seven to 10 times and they then recommended that I see a dermatologist. I would have went on to the dermatologist. He would have told me it was a severe heat rash and I need to work in a cool environment. 
we did that and the lash advance from my legs and my botox to my back and my hands Following several weeks of sick leave, her condition appeared to improve. But days after returning to work, the symptoms were back, but worse this time. In October 2022, Smith resigned from her job. Since then, she has been unable to work because the condition is painful and even soap can cause severe irritation, which results in her skin peeling off. My routine basically is to bathe with a wax. Um, 15 minutes after that, my skin dries, I moisturize with the wax, and then I put liquid and heavy parfum mixed together 10 minutes after. And then there's a topical cream for the worst affected areas, because I have to put it on my entire body. My shampoo has been changed because my hair falls out due to it, because my scalp does the same thing. Without the medication, my body goes into a drastic change. My skin is literally like gray, it's like alligator skin, and it itches like crazy. So normally I'm on histo or some antihistamine constantly all the time. And as a mother, that subtracts from me because when I'm dealing with my son, I'm either irritated, uncomfortable, or I'm either sleepy. A medical report from a doctor at a polyclinic diagnoses her as suffering from an allergic reaction and irritant contact dermatitis after exposure to an allergen at her workplace. A well-known dermatologist recommended tests, including for air quality, be done at her former workplace. A letter from the Labor Department says a safety and health officer visited the paint room at the business in question on January 9th, 2023, more than two months after Ms. Smith resigned. Based on observations and interviews with workers, the department found the actions taken to provide a safe place of work adequate. Ms. Smith has received no assistance from her former employer. I sent them pictures, I sent them the doctors, all that information, and they're basically saying that it never happened to anyone there and I haven't passed the probation period for them to do anything about it. CBC was directed to speak to the company's HR officer by several members of the management team, but numerous calls and voice messages have gone unanswered. In the meantime, Ms. Smith is left to depend on the generosity of friends, family, churches and charities to pay for hundreds of dollars in medication each month and for basic necessities such as food. She's been doing a number of online courses with a hope of finding remote work to be able to support herself and her son. Sharika Griffith, CBC News. Well, CBC News also reached out to a number of dermatologists in an effort to get further insight into what the illness could be, but all contacted declined comment. All systems are go for this year's Harrison College Mosaic Concert Series. The assurance from the principal, Kayleen Kelman Holder. A CBC team caught up with the principal and some musicians who were rehearsing in the school's hall ahead of this weekend's shows to be held at the Frank Colombo Hall. This platform has brought together students, past and present, friends of Harson College, to produce what can only be described as musical excellence at its very, very, very best. This year's concert series features a tribute to Mr. Roger Gittins, who is renowned for his excellence, not only as a musician himself, but as an educator. And uh, the variety of acts we have here today, many of those acts have been um, influenced by Mr. Gittins. Ms. Holder stresses the Mosaic series plays a vital role in raising funds for many of the school's ventures. When you see our sporting programs, when you see our students perform in art, when you see our students visit and do our student exchanges and so on, those funds have been raised not only through um, the work of the PTA in general, but Mosaic has contributed in time. Sports Night is brought to you by Power A. Pause is power. And by Dasani. Live first. The Sunny after. 
time for the sporting action as we're joined by the sporting girl, Anne-Marie Burke. Anne-Marie, good evening. Good evening to you, Pearson. I have some good news. The Ryan Brathwaite track at the Usain Bolt Complex is finally ready and in time for Monday's start of the Sunny Power Aid BSAC Championships. I was at the final walkthrough today. On your mark, get set, go. The end is here. The relaying of the Ryan Brathwaite track at the Usain Bolt Sports Complex is complete and ready for track and field action. A site visit saw final cleanup work being done, along with the crucial surveying of the track for World Athletic Certification by WA Certified Severe Andreas Eder. Head of the UW Academy of Sport, Dr. Rudolph Allen, explained just what that entailed. They're just looking to make sure that it officially it's a 400 meter track and all of the starters and so on are officially at the right points. Um, that shouldn't take very long. As I said, the guy is here today and by the end of the day, hopefully we'll have that certification. The relaying process started back in January and Dr. Allen explained why it took a bit longer than expected. Based on the initial um, analysis from Raga Paul, the work was supposed to be completed in six weeks. Unfortunately, when they start, you know, like when you build a house and you start to pull down, you see more termites than you had before. So unfortunately, when they started to dig up the track, there were some areas that uh, were a little worse and then they found new areas that were bad too as well. Um, the track was infected with a fungus and therefore you had to remove those bad parts of the track um, that were infected with the fungus and they started finding more areas. So that's one of the reasons why it took so long. Um, we were able to get Ragapal to send out some more experts. Originally we had one expert here. Uh, we ended up um, having four experts from Ragapal and that helped to speed up the process. And here we are today with a nice new spanking track. It's a lot bouncier than the previous track. I know there were some complaints about the previous track being kind of hard. This one is a lot bouncier and soft. So we anticipate that the athletes should have um, some good running, uh, quality running on the track. As you can see, the track is now red a move from the previous yellow and aquamarine. This decision was a strategic one. The aquamarine and yellow, there are two things about it. It was more expensive and harder to maintain. Um, the yellow didn't hold up very good to the sun uh, and also the fungus. Um, the red is a bit cheaper, but it's also better to, for, in terms of maintenance of the track. So we went with the red. You can imagine, it was a costly process. Initially, it came in around a million dollars. Um, and of course, with the excess um, that they found in terms of damage and, and fungus and so on, it pushed it a little over. I, at this point, I must say, uh, we are very thankful and grateful to the government of Barbados, who would have gifted us some money. I don't want to say the amount, um, but that was very instrumental in, in us getting the track. Also to start the poor Barbados too as well. Um, they were able, they gave us some money to help with the track. And uh, of course, the University of West Indies, through the Principal Landis, uh, the Bursa, and the Registrar. There's expected to be a soft opening on Monday at the start of the BSAC Championships. The Business Report is brought to you with the kind compliments of the National Insurance and Social Security Service. More than a contribution, it's your lifeline. In business tonight, artificial intelligence and consumer rights took center stage during a public outreach program in the city. The drive to increase awareness was organized by the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs to coincide with World Consumer Rights Day. Trevor Thorpe reports. Acting Senior Trade Officer of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, Alison Archer, told the business report the outreach program was not only to look at artificial intelligence, but also to reinforce consumer rights. She said additional legislation is coming in this regard. We are embarking on a consumer protection agenda. And in this new agenda, we are hoping to include the AI, looking at AI legislation, how we as a reimagine our thinking, uh, how we do our con how we carry our consumer protection mandate. So for us, it's not just today. It's far more than today. Because as I said, we're, we're thinking of this whole new consumer protection agenda. And with this agenda, you can be assured that AI and how, how we handle it, not just from a consumer perspective, but also from a departmental perspective, how it's handled. The trade officer said artificial intelligence is only one new area that has to be addressed. 
According to her, the department has a much wider focus. The important thing was to get consumers to recognize their rights, know their rights, but also recognize that they have responsibilities. I mean, my team here, we work very hard to promote that because AI is just one aspect of the day. But knowing your rights and knowing your responsibilities is even far more important. Public counsel Douglas Frederick said his office is concerned with the infusion of AI in the lives of consumers and the outreach program was to bring public awareness of global changes and how people should gear themselves up for the future. We understand that some consumers are going to be bombarded by automated systems which could cause them to have to, 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 to scrutinize contracts, to scrutinize their, their daily transactions because sometimes they can be charged for things which they have signed up once for but are automated so that they generate a cost to them. We are concerned about that. We are also concerned about the information which is being kept, the decisions that are made for them through artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence is a a good thing and it's a bad thing so therefore we want to embrace the good things about artificial intelligence but we want to be aware of the 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 the, the, the cons regarding to art regarding artificial intelligence the organizers say more outreach initiatives are in the works as they seek to keep Barbadians up to date with changes and advances in the world environment Trevor Thorpe for the business report Government's comprehensive domestic and external debt restructuring efforts, which started in 2018, have been reaping success. However, Chief Executive Officer of Fortress Fund Managers, Peter Arinder, says there is still much work to be done for the country to continue generating economic growth. Mr. Arinder is warning that the country's debt meter is running at an increasing rate owing to the instruments used in the restructuring process. The external debt, the amount of debt owed to the U.S. dollars, has increased 75% since 2018. It's now $5 billion. When we think of the foreign reserves that Barbados has accumulated since the, the restructuring, almost entirely been borrowed. Now, if you remember the graph that Rashad showed of all the, all the interest rates being really low and then getting high, our government was borrowing at very low rates. As those things mature, it's going to be a different story. With, uh, with higher rates, so costs will go up. We saw the restructure bonds, coupons are rising, and domestic insurance is going to be resuming. The message I would like to leave you with is there's been much good progress. I'm sure people in this room have all contributed to the progress in their various ways, but I would like to suggest there's still much more work to do. Back for another look at sports with Anna Marie, who promises us action. Yes, all the sports you can think about from the schools as further preparation for Knapsack's track events. Sela Primary Ignatius Byron Half Moon Fort held a joint meet at the North Stars Sports Club today. CBC's Anna Marie Goodrich Boyce reports. The little ones shall lead them. This is the under nine girls 80 meter dash. And immediately the athletes in the center lane went to the front of the field. Focus your attention on the young lady in the gray top. That's Miracle Moore of Sela, the champion, winning ahead of Alexa Beckles and Ayasha Hines of Ignatius Boyer. The under nine boys were up next and Sela were celebrating again in the balance early on before Tyrone Griffith assumed the lead and took victory. The pair of Ethan Edwards and Neymar Critchlow of Ignatius Boyer were second and third respectively. Move along smoothly to the under 11 division. The girls going 100 meters. Pretty quick start from the competitors. And here comes Janae Connell of Ignatius Boyer. Arms and legs pumping. And you can ring the bell because it's class dismissed. Shakania Prescott of Half Moon Fort took the runners up position with Tiara Beatty of Sela third. Let's pick up the boys' equivalent at the midway stage where Damani Broom, closest to your screen, had already pulled away from the field with speed to burn. That's impressive. His schoolmate Raquan Herewood was second with Thierry Butcher of Half Moon Fort finishing third. The under 13 girls followed and already it was a done deal. Janiah Haynes of Ignatius Boyer stamped her authority ahead of Taja Herbert and Ageland Collymore of Half Moon Fort. 
We finish off with the under 13 boys, 100 meter. It's the big event, anyone's race after 50 meters. But these three competitors took charge and it's a close battle right to the end. On the line is where Marcress Broom of Sela wins it. Xavier Chassain of Half Moon Fort was second with Delano Peters of Sela third. And Mark Goodrich, boys, CBC Sports. The sponsors of the annual Barbados Secondary Schools Athletic Championships have been acknowledged for their role in the development of track and field in Barbados. Despite some setbacks with the completion of the track at the Youth Symbol Sports Complex, sponsors say they are fully committed to the championship's success. During a ceremony at Queen's College last evening, title sponsor the Sandy Power Aid and a number of others said they are happy to be on board once again. We are looking forward to an exciting and riveting competition um, starting next week. Um, the Sunny Power Aid, we have been part of the BSAT journey for over decades um, before our company, Barbados Bottling Company. So this is nothing new for us and it is something that we are committed to because we are committed to our youth, we are committed to sport. You will see us not only involved in track and field, but football, um, volleyball, cricket, netball, Whatever it is, um, we are very passionate about sports and we are extremely passionate about our young people. Co-chair of the BISA Organizing Committee, Andrew Brathwaite, says with forced changes to the meet due to the initial unavailability of the Usain Bolt Sports Complex, he expects a rivalry to be intense. What I think you can expect as sponsors is a dog-dog fight for points at this championship. And sometimes the situation that you're presented with provides an opportunity to make, make things happen a little different as well. So one athlete per school means that at semi-final stage you have to battle. You have to really battle to get into the final. Uh, so it means that the semi-finals Monday and Tuesday next week will be more intense. Uh, it also means, and this I think is a plus, that every final will have eight athletes from different schools. This will likely be the first time that we will have finals where more schools may be represented. So even though the change has been made, I do think that there are positives coming out of that change. Aspects of the meet will also be named after two ladies who recently passed away and would have contributed significantly to the competition. The high jump, all age groups of the high jump will be known as the Sandra Jokes High Jump. And the Field Event Championship, which we held last week, will carry the name of Shakira Shuri. This year, we will present awards for the first, second, and third place team in the Field Event Championship. And those awards will be donated by a member of this staff here, actually at Queen's College, who has said to me that anything that we need to do to honor her memory, she will pay for. Now tickets for the semi-finals and finals will be available at Duty Free Barbados and SO Blackrock for 20 and $25 respectively. Pearson, that's it for sports. Anne-Marie, thank you. Thank you for spending it with us. I'm Pearson Bowen. For the crew, to all of you, good night. Have a wonderful weekend.